It was August 16th, 1914, and everything was gone. All that remained was a smoldering pile of ashes where once stood a grand house. The architect could only imagine what horrors unfolded on that very same spot just a day prior. The moments after lunch when the woman he loved, Mema, was killed with a single strike by a blunt hatchet wielded by a crazed servant. Six more people were killed, including Mema's young children, moments later. After which, the murderer proceeded to pour gasoline throughout the grand house and lit a match, engulfing the house in flames, leaving the architect's life in ruins. After the smoke cleared, the grieving Frank Lloyd Wright wasn't able to sleep or eat. He felt ill for months after, haunted by what happened. What's more, the newspapers wrote unsympathetic articles, condemning Wright as an adulterer since Mema wasn't technically his wife, and looked at the murders as kind of a comeuppance for the architect. But as he tried to rebuild his broken heart and home, it was becoming clear to him that he couldn't stay in the Midwest. Not only was he dealing with his grief, but few clients would hire him. He needed to get away, to escape. So he did what so many people have done throughout history. He headed for California. Over the next decade, he would slowly make his home in California, designing several projects, most notably a series of houses that would take him down a new path in his career. This moment of reflection and discovery would redefine him and cement himself as one of the most influential architects in modern history. Wright's first visit to Los Angeles was in January 1915, but he would remain in Wisconsin for a few more months to rebuild Taliesin. In that time, Wright would also receive a seemingly average commission. It was a simple design for a warehouse for a wholesale grocer named A.D. German. Though simple in its design, it would signal an evolution in Wright's architectural thinking. In the past, Wright designed primarily in the Prairie School style, a style he once pioneered in the beginning of his career. It featured a low profile and low pitched roofs with strong horizontal lines and stained glass windows and a heavy use of brick. But for the design of the warehouse, he more or less abandoned that style and instead designed an almost monumental structure, a temple of sorts, resembling that of a Mayan temple like the ones found in Shishin Itzel on the Yucatan Peninsula. And that was no coincidence. Wright had become interested in pre-Columbian architecture as far back as the 1890s, when he saw an exhibit on Mayan architecture at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. He would incorporate elements of Mayan architecture into his design for the Midway Gardens in Chicago, which was the last building he designed before the murders at Taliesin. However, the warehouse was a more blatant interpretation of Mayan architecture. The striking departure from Wright's Prairie School style was merely an overture to what was to come across the country in Los Angeles. Los Angeles in the 1910s was quickly becoming a boom town, due in part to the thriving movie studios that dotted around the city. It was a place for a fresh start, a place of possibilities. After settling in Los Angeles, Wright would begin work on two major projects. The first was for the luxurious Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. The other was a vast artist's community, complete with dorms, theaters, studios, and a house for its patron, an oil heiress named Aileen Barnstall. Barnstall met Wright in Chicago sometime in 1915, while he was rebuilding Taliesin. She discussed her vision, and the two hit it off. They shared in their interest of the arts, and Wright saw the commission as an opportunity to create something groundbreaking in the city of Los Angeles. While he worked on the A.D. German warehouse in the Imperial Hotel, Wright received word that Barnstall had found a place for her community of the arts, around 30 acres of land known as Olive Hill. It was a dream site with an unmatched view of Los Angeles. 
The first designs for Barnstall's house appeared to be a step back into Wright's past prairie school style. In his final design, Wright's interest in pre-Columbian architecture appears again. This time, Wright was taking direct inspiration from the temples found in Peleki. If we look at the front of the house, it's monumental in scale. The house rises from a sturdy base to a prominent Manzanard-like roof which conveys the heaviness and permanence of the house. In reality, though, the building was not made of strong stone, but rather plaster, stucco, and wood. Just below the roof is a band of repeating abstract sculptures of Barnsdall's favorite flower, the hollyhock, and they were made to look like they were cut from stone. These sculptures were instead made of cast concrete formed from a mold. The sculptures became a central motif of the house, hence why the house was eventually called the Hollyhock House. Wright situated the house around a central courtyard. Inside, he incorporated two bedrooms on the ground floor, there was a nursery for Barnsdall's young child, and two bedrooms for servants. Nearby, there was a galley kitchen and dining room. And in the heart of the house was a grand living room, the library and seating room on either sides. As was important in every Wright house, the fireplace in the living room was grand, complete with a moat and a large bass relief. The room also offered fantastic views of Los Angeles, and because of the house's positioning on the site, it often received a gentle breeze that traveled throughout the house. In addition to the design of the house, Wright and Barnstall also designed a vast collection of buildings, including housing for artists and actors, a school, commercial space, a theater, and a community playhouse, affectionately known as the Little Dipper. It was the first time we see Wright thinking about using textile blocks, but we'll get back to that in a bit. As construction of the house began, it was clear that trouble was coming. Barnstall could never keep to one idea, and would constantly request changes. On the other hand, Wright refused to compromise on many of the project's key features, particularly on the issues of incorporating Barnstall's vast collection of paintings. Wright made sure to feature wall details throughout the house that would prevent her from hanging up any non-Wright approved works of art. As a result of all the design issues, Wright found himself drifting his attention to the more important Imperial Hotel Commission. To fill the void was his son Lloyd Wright, who worked to complete the house, and the two small dorm buildings nearby. The house was completed in 1923, but the drama with the construction had caused the original roughly $75,000 budget to skyrocket. Barnstall didn't even live an entire year in the house. In 1923, while the house was nearing completion, she offered the property to the city of Los Angeles. The city reluctantly accepted the 36 acres of land. Eventually, a theater and an art gallery was built on the site years later. The Hollyhock House remains and was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2019. What the Hollyhock House represents is the crucial turning point in Wright's career. For the next few projects Wright will complete in Los Angeles, each will pick up where the Hollyhock House left off. As Wright marches towards a new architecture and crafts the ideas that will inspire the architecture of his most prolific period. Immediately following the Hollyhock House, Wright received a commission from a previous client, Alice Millard, an antique dealer who previously hired Wright to design a house for her in Illinois back at the turn of the century. As she moved to California, she wanted a house for a challenging site she purchased in Pasadena. What appeared as a challenging site, however, gave Wright the perfect canvas to begin work on his next Los Angeles house. The site was incredibly steep, with a ravine and a stream cut right through the property. Wright decided to incorporate the stream within the design, an idea he would incorporate into the design for a certain house in Pennsylvania around 10 years later. The house was rather small by comparison to the Hollyhock house. The house was three stories, with the dining room and kitchen on the bottom floor, a living room on the main floor, and bedrooms on the top floor. The Millard house is the first time in which Wright uses a new building system he referred to as textile blocks. They work like this. A hollow precast concrete block with an abstract pattern were placed together with rebar placed between the blocks and then filled in with concrete to make a solid wall. The use of these blocks made for a rich texture on the house both inside and out. Wright designed the buildings to create drama and mystery, almost like walking into a movie set. He also wanted buildings to feel as though they belonged where they were standing. 
and he did this incredibly well at the Millard House. With all of the trees surrounding it, it appears that it's been there for centuries. All of this makes this one of Wright's most underrated houses, and shows the way that Wright was expanding his architectural style. Built at the same time as the Millard House was the Stower House. It was designed for John Stower, a physician. Like the Millard House, it featured textile blocks, but where the other houses featured one abstract design, the Stower House features a total of four original designs by Wright. As with the Hollyhock House, the house was designed to be monumental, even though it was a small footprint on a very steep site. Because of this small footprint, the house had to express verticality. It tries to reach high above the ground with its strong vertical columns and windows that look out over the city. The sense of grandeur is carried into the interior. The living room is rather small, and yet Wright plays with the scale of the features in the house like the fireplace. The fireplace is grand. It's almost too big for the space, and yet it fits perfectly within the space. And yet for as interesting his playing with scale and verticality is, Wright wasn't particularly satisfied with the final product. He viewed it lacking something. His disappointment might have been for the architecture or for his life as a whole. While in the midst of his time in Los Angeles, his personal life continued to be shrouded in misery. During his darkest moments following the murder, a seemingly bright spot appeared out of that darkness. Her name was Miriam Noel. Wright began dating her, and following his divorce with his first wife, whom he was technically still married to during his time with Mema, the two of them got married. However, following the marriage, her brightness appeared to dim rather quickly. Miriam was addicted to drugs and was known to get violent, attacking Wright on occasion. Their marriage as you can probably guess, was a disaster, and caused Wright to throw himself into his work further, with several projects, including two more houses. One interesting, and often unmentioned, project of Wright's was for a master-planned neighborhood known as Doheny Ranch. It would continue his experimentation with textile blocks and Mayan revival architecture. The neighborhood would encompass 414 acres, with some 200 to 300 homes. Each house would vary slightly in both size and style, but all would be built using the textile block method. In what drawings we have, it appears that the community would be designed to resemble a Mayan city, as it appears in ruins, with foliage growing amongst the buildings. Though his plans were rejected, the concept would find its way through various moments in Wright's later career, including his design for a utopian city known as Broad Acre City. It was during this time that Wright began thinking about the possibilities of using textile blocks as a way of constructing houses more affordably and quicker for America's growing middle class. The reality was textile blocks proved difficult to work with. They were notorious for leaking and making the blocks also prove challenging. However, the idea for creating affordable houses would also inspire Wright throughout his life, culminating with his Usonian homes of the 1930s into the 1950s, which were designed to be built for around $5,000. Wright's Usonian homes would become a touchstone of his later career as he would design hundreds of Usonian homes towards the end of his life. What is by far the largest and most impressive of Wright's LA houses is the Innes House. The house was described by famed architecture historian Vincent Scully as, quote, a temple floating above the smog. It takes what was started in the Millard and Stower houses and took it to its logical conclusion. It was designed for Charles and Maribel Innes, and the house stands like a fortress on the hill. Simply put, it's grand, it's exotic, and it's fanciful. It features a massive retaining wall that supports the rest of the building. And in addition, provides the house with a base that elevates the house to that of a temple. Inside the expansiveness unfolds through various spaces, both grand and intimate, well lit and dark. It's often described as tomb-like, and it's not an entirely unfair statement. It creates a completely different feel for a home, 
one that may be inhospitable for some. For as captivating as the Innes house is, it's not as indicative of what's to come in Wright's later career as his last house in Los Angeles. For that, we head over to the Samuel Freeman house. Wright completed the house in 1924. It offers the greatest evolution of Wright's thinking. The hint of Mayan architecture is still there, but it's not overt. The symbolism is diminished. The house hugs the line between ancient temple and modern pavilion. Designed for Samuel and Harriet Freeman at a cost of about $23,000, the couple became interested in Wright following a trip to the Hollyhock House. The Freeman site offered fantastic views of Hollywood below, and Wright positioned the house to capture that view. He designed the house with an expansive living room. This differed greatly from the other Los Angeles houses, which were sometimes tomb-like inside. In this way, the Freeman house seems to defy logic. How can a series of concrete blocks possibly make such large expanses? In reality, the textile blocks were reinforced through rebar and concrete, which made them a solid beam, but you wouldn't know that simply by looking at them. Another great feature of the house are two large corner windows. Wright liked to talk about breaking up the room or the box, and he does this in this house by taking what is typically the darkest part of the room and opens them up to fantastic views of the city in the distance. What's more is that there's this interaction between the solidness of the textile blocks and the lightness or the fragile nature of the glass. How these two materials come together to provide both light and sturdiness is another facet of why this building is such an interesting experiment by Wright, and we see the beginnings of Wright's later career. He'll incorporate the openness of the living room here with his houses in the Usonian homes later down the line. Those corner windows will make their appearance a few years later, most notably in Falling Water in 1936. What's not seen much in this house, as mentioned earlier, is the overt pre-Columbian architectural details. It appears that Wright started to feel that the style wasn't going to catch on. It wasn't going to be California's new regional style to replace the Spanish colonial style. In the end, the style was more of a fad for him. And by the time he began designing the Freeman House, the textile blocks as a way of creating a Mayan revival style had all but vanished. He's not so preoccupied with capturing the monumental nature of Mayan ruins anymore, and is instead looking eastward to Europe and the emergence of modernism. With the Freeman House, it seems as though Wright's time in Los Angeles was winding down. The success he hoped for wasn't appearing for him. By the late 1920s, Wright would make his way back to Wisconsin and to Taliesin, which was entirely rebuilt by then. But that's not to say that Wright's time in Los Angeles was a total loss, as we've seen. It gave him a fresh start in a young city starting out. Here, he could play around with new ideas and experiment, the results of which would inspire his career for the rest of his life. But times would be tough in the years immediately following his time in Los Angeles. Commissions would still be scarce, and his rocky second marriage would bring him down. But once he emerged from that despair, he would quickly rise to become the Frank Lloyd Wright we remember him for today. The Frank Lloyd Wright that would redefine the office building, the suburban home, the skyscraper, the art gallery, and even the city. All of these touchstones, in some way, can be traced right back to Los Angeles and those projects that both looked back in time 